that there was uh, the first talk. The second talk is, uh, was foreshadowed in the first one. We'll be talking on, uh, Cornelius will be talking about open source and he has a great experience in open source. Uh, Cornelius was part of the KDE team, also open uh, Zuse team here. Uh, I mean, it was both a German uh, project, right? If I remember correctly. And now he works at Deutsche Bahn and he has a very interesting title that's got my attention and that's uh, open source steward. Uh, and uh, I think maybe he will explain what that means later on. Uh, but uh, we will be talking about inner source and open source and all that stuff. And that sounds very exciting to me. So uh, if we have our presentation ready, we have it ready. We have it ready. Cool. So please help me welcome Cornelius. I'm not sure we're recording anymore because we, we do recording. Technology is actually only if you have some, some, uh, <laughs> some okay. Uh, <laughs> the only question I because I saw a few meetings should we do uh, two minutes, three minutes, five 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 Relax. I, I like a relaxed audience, so <laughs> take your bio break. <laughs> Can you say something to us? Yeah, sure. Hello, hello. Yeah, okay. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. I mean, it's only for the. Yeah, okay. Let, let's see <laughs> how this works yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> It's like for sharing the LaTeX and getting right in the cloud and it uh, renders. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It would look a little bit, you know, like uh, he has this like a chemical attached to it. Yeah, it's attached to the Roman. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it's attached to Roman. But it's it, it, when I was writing, it was still yeah, hard to change the form, especially yeah. the mathematical yes, symbols. Yes, yes. Always yes. The Yeah, I thought, how can you actually, because I would like the format that is readable on the iPhone, and the app is not so good. Should you even use a GitHub as a very good thing with the iBook then? And if you if you write in pages or you export the pages, pages you can export to GitHub. Yeah, but that's easy because I can Google Docs the pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, we start formatting the process. Yeah. If you want to play more, there is the iBook author, which is meant for people who make uh, textbooks. I always have five minutes to get a, get a green no, barcode no, no, no. on black background. Yeah. <laughs> <We're already laughs> <two minutes. laughs> There's a, a funny license because if you uh, create something with iBook author, which is like a Mac application for free, you can only sell it in iTunes store or distribute it for free, whatever. No, that's different. The pub is for if you do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Gitbook is for your I am quite sure. That's life. I always wonder, like some some people put books for free online, and they still sell free copies. 
Like I know that uh, Axel Auschmeyer he writes work for JavaScript as that. All of his books are free to read online. And he's still selling, I mean, the O'Reilly has the books, and like, it's like expensive books, it's like about 40, 40 euros, right? For, yeah. Or you can read online. That's like. But I think it, because you can't make much money on this anyway. So I think that usually. With these kind of books, I don't think you can get. If you're really. I mean, if you're, yeah. if you want to do some American process, and you do like an accelerated book or something. Yeah, that, then yeah. I think that but I think technical books more. And I think it's more for exposure, and you can sell your workshops or yeah. video. Yeah. 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 Workshop, that's the real, uh, yeah. That's why your CV. Yeah, to be a published yeah, author. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. And who would argue if a guy who wrote a book about <laughs> yeah, I there was an offer to get uh, twenty of these uh, catalog stickers for five euros. So I yeah, said it. It's like a it's a cut out of the sticker. I watched also some videos, right? And then a while. So you have this, you have the same name on all three platforms. Of course. I mean, that's the beauty when you start. Uh, you know, when you, every new platform there is, you just go there and you know, it's a good name. <laughs> yeah. I saw you even use that very often. Ah yes, I wanted to debate the four letters. I should have done that today. It's, uh, <laughs> working software over comprehensive documentation. Oh, okay. The thing for organizations, this is wrong. This only applies to deterministic programs or deterministic processes. Because if you want to form an organization, you think you need comprehensive documentation. Because otherwise, you will just end up in a bonfire culture. And you have no central code against which you can improve. I think it's all on files. People tell it's all. It's about what comes first, right? I think that when they like when they fight against is the working for principle when we have specification, aka a comprehensive documentation, and then you then even implement the code. I would I would agree with that. Yeah. 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 You start formulating all your like, I will try to get people in. I was trying to get people in. I was ich glaube, er hat äh, eben schon aufgedreht. Does it work? No, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. That's a little bit less. <laughs> so, you hear me. <laughs> yeah. Ja, 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 ja. Hallo, hallo, hallo. Nee, funktioniert. <laughs> So we we are set. Yeah, we are set. So uh, welcome back from the bio break. I still like the name. That's nothing. So again, really is here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, I think it's also a nice follow up to to um, Hannes' talk, uh, coming from a different perspective. Um, yeah, my name is Cornelius Schumacher. Um, my title is Open Source Steward. Um, I have this title since uh, a, bit, a little bit more than two months when, when I joined, the, joined DB Syste, which is the IT daughter of Deutsche Bahn. Um, it's about 4,500 people, um, and we're actually in a transformation of getting agile. And uh, I have a history of uh, something like 20 years in open source communities. And DB Sista thought, okay, we need this experience, so let's hire this guy for uh, being the open source steward, being responsible for open source processes, helping teams, um, projects um, to use open source, to contribute to open source, to uh, make best use of it. 
Yeah, and uh, today we'll talk about um, inner source. Um, so how to apply open source principles to uh, to, to a company, uh, to also big companies, and um, benefit from that. And that, I think, fits nicely what, what you talked about before. So um, starting, um, if you look at Wikipedia, the definition of um, inner source is uh, use of open source software principles um, using the, the, the open source development process, the development practices, and establishing an open source culture. So the question we have to answer here is, and um, that's something where I like to actually start with, is um, what is open source culture? What are the open source values? Also the question, what are these open source practices? And then I will go to some tactics how to actually get these into corporations. So um, what is open source? Uh, what do you think? Is it this, creative chaos, intuition, freedom, or is it that, industrial production, control, processes? What do you think? It's both. That's, that's a good answer. <laughs> I think it's also a good answer to say, okay, it's only the left one. I, I, I would say kind of the prejudice is that the freedom, chaotic, intuitive side, that's the open source side, and the corporate side, that's where everything is in order and you have structure and process and everything. Um, but I will try to show you that it's actually uh, more than that and the answer isn't that simple. So, and I want to start with the, with the values behind that. So open source values, and I apologize for having a lot of text on the, on the slides. I didn't have the time to add empty slides. I will add that in the next version of the talk. Um, so, but I, I was carried away with adding content, so <laughs> yeah, uh, I will show you that. Uh, the values uh, are very important. That's the base for the culture. And of course, the predominant value uh, in open source is openness. That's like making a project accessible from the outside. And the basic uh, basis for that are the um, free software, the open source principles that open source software is free to use, to share, to modify, to give modified versions to others. So that's the basic freedoms which um, make it possible to, uh, yeah, to open up a project. And together with that comes that uh, the, these freedoms are actually organized in a very standardized way. You have standard open source licenses, um, so everybody knows what to do. You don't have to sign a contract. You don't have to negotiate terms or anything. You can just take the code which is published on an open source license. You know what it means because other people have done it. You can take it. The conditions are pretty clear. You have to adhere to it, but it's, it's a standard way to uh, access projects. That makes them open. Um, and that also makes a low barrier not only for use, but also for um, participating. You, you can join a community, you can join a project, because again, the terms are clear, they are open, and communities value this openness of welcoming people to their project, so you can actually chime in and work with them. And how is that possible? Um, how, how does this fit together? I think an important element is that this openness is only possible with a shared purpose. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. So the second very important value is transparency. Um, in open source projects, you see what is happening. You see what people are doing. You see who is deciding. You see when people are doing what. Um, and that's something which is uh, the information you need to, to work with others. If, you, if everything is transparent, um, actually you have the ability to find out what's going on. You, you can come in and um, do something. And maybe even more important, you can also learn from that. If things are transparent, you can learn from what people are doing. You can learn from what works, you can learn from the mistakes because you see what's happening behind the doors. Um, there are no secrets uh, where things just silently get pushed under a carpet if things don't work. You see them in the open. It can be painful, but it's a learning experience. And this, by the way, is something which is really a, a dream for researchers. You see a lot of research about open source software because it's great, because you have everything um, open, all the data. You, you can process uh, tons of communication for years and, and do social or technical or political or whatever studies. It's a whole discipline of uh, people doing, doing research there. And that, that gives interesting results because that also tell us, tells us something about what works and what not and how things work. And the, the other thing is that 
um, this, this openness um, allows people to be accountable and, and, and in some way it forces them to be accountable. If you work in the open, if it's transparent what you are doing, then you better write good code and you better behave in a way which you can be in, in the open. And that's something which I think leads to uh, quality software, maybe also to quality communities. Um, um, it's, it's an important, I think, effect of having transparency as a, one of the big, big values. A third value, which is very important, is collaboration. Um, that's kind of um, one of the more practical values which defines open source culture. It's really a lot about collaboration. It's about collaboration on scale, working together on this shared purpose. If you have this common itch to scratch, if you have this common vision, and that's most open source communities are um, open to, to volunteers. They are, they are driven by people who want to work on the project, not who are paid to work on the project. They might still be paid, but it's not their main, main motivation in, in, in many cases. So they have this shared purpose, and that, that makes working together kind of the natural um, mode how, how, you, how you do that. And uh, an important part of that is that most of open source communities are organized in a way that this collaboration is happening on, on a peer level. It's not that you join it as a company and then you, you send a committee of people who do something, but uh, usually you work as an individual. So the Apache way, for example, it describes that, that, that it's, it's a peer community. So you work as an individual, as a developer, you're employed by somebody in many, many cases, but that's not, not the prime thing which drives uh, what you're doing. You work for the project. There's a goal, there's a vision, there, there's a common purpose, there's a process. Um, and people understand that, how to do that, so they can collaborate in a way which is effective um, to achieve uh, the, the goals of the people and, and the project. And, and this makes it possible to also work across different teams and organizations. What you see in open source is that um, a lot of the power of open source projects comes because it scales, because you don't stop at a boundary where somebody is at an, in a different team or in a different company or on a different continent or whatever, uh, because there are no, um, there are no barriers um, or open source projects try to lower the barriers as much as possible. And uh, if you take this, the saying, there are always more smart people outside of a company than inside of a company, unless the whole world is one company, that's true. And uh, making use of this is something which I think is a qualification of open source, which is quite powerful. And this, this is an insight. If I can work in a way I can collaborate with others across boundaries, then I can make use of this, the, really this um, yeah, knowledge and insight and power of, of a bigger community. Now looking a little bit more on the more structured values. Commitment, uh, I think, is also a value which is very strong in open source. People have skin in the game. People do open source um, for fun um, or because they feel it has to be done or they want to better the world. Um, it's rarely because they are forced to do it or because they have no choice. So they take action and they also take responsibility. Um, and open source people, I think it's kind of this myth that the open source person is this volunteer student who has no experience. It's mostly professionals. It's people who have learned how to create software. It's people who do that for a living. And um, they might do that as part of their job or in some other project constellation, but it's profession, professionals. And then if you put these people together across organizations, you get a pool of talent you can't hire. It's, it's just impossible to get this into one company. And another element of commitment is the sense of ownership. So which comes with this, that you have skin in the game. You, you feel not like, like an uh, employee or somebody who is directed, but somebody who shares um, something of the project, who, who, is a, who is an owner of the project, more like with the spirit of an um, entrepreneur. And um, in, in some cases, some projects, you can, you can see actually this in a form where you have this common ownership of code so that um, you get when you join the project, you get commit rights to everything. So the KDE project, for example, is, an, is, is one example. You get commit rights to almost everything in the project. You can commit to all applications, to, to everything. And this is only possible because people feel responsible and they feel ownership of the code and it's not about vandalism or whatever. So this simply doesn't happen. 
um, because people are committed to the project. Another open source value, and uh, you had that in your slides as well, the predictability. I think that's, that's a, uh, a very good value. Um, in some open source projects, they actually spell this out and say, okay, we don't like surprises. So don't surprise us with, with features or with big uh, pull requests or whatever. Uh, work in the open, uh, start with us before you write, talk to us before you write code, and uh, uh, don't work secretly. Uh, that, that's not something which works in an open source project. Companies like to do that, of course, to get a marketing splash, but for the process, this um, no, having no secrets makes a project much more predictable because you can openness, transparency, to see what is going on. And this is, I think, quite impressively um, uh, yeah, stated in, in some of the transparent release process. Yes, for example, the Linux kernel, um, they don't really have a sophisticated process management or whatever. I mean, they have a maintainer who does releases every two or three months. And he puts in every two or three months something like 13,000 changes. That's, that's a lot. Um, and they support that. They, they have long-term support releases, Linux distributions to support this code for 10 years. That's very predictable. And that's something which is really in, ingrained in the community core values. Other examples like other Linux distributions, they have this cadence of, of uh, releases or Eclipse, for example, they, they also have this very strong focus on having a rhythm in releasing and they, they have a release where they take all the projects and release them on the same schedule and celebrate this uh, timing. That's something which I think is, is uh, yeah, a nice result of any software project and caused by a value in open source projects. And the third one, uh, which may be also a little bit surprising, compliance. Um, maybe not the one you, you think of first when you think about open source, but actually compliance is an important value. And you have to think about this in the way that open source wasn't started as a technical thing, but as a legal thing. Open source is a legal construction. The idea to use the license, uh, to use the copyright, um, and use the legal system to make sure software stays free that's, that's the idea which open source is based on, not, not the idea of let's get rid of, of uh, all the legal rights and so on, we want to share freely. No, but let's use the legal system. And that's something why I think a lot of open source people are actually very uh, conscious about licenses and being compliant with them. And this also um, goes further down to code. If you look at how open source projects work, they, they have a very sophisticated way to have this um, traceability of source code. So you have Git histories. Uh, there's a lot of effort into making this um, in, in a way that you can follow. Um, you're signing commits. You have these conventions of making sure that it's, it's stated who has reviewed everything and so on. Also effect of this transparency, if it's transparent, then this matters. If you work internally, just and nobody sees the code, then you might think it's not important. And this, I think, yeah, states this value of compliance, I think in a way which is uh, yeah, quite beneficial, independent if, if you're doing open source or anything else. So th these are um, values, there are more values, there are values like, like fun or security, which are also important. Uh, but I don't want to talk about them in detail anymore. But what I want to talk about is how these values translate, translate in uh, uh, these open source development practices. So what, what is happening there? If you go down um, one level and uh, make it a little bit more practical. And I would say uh, the, the core practice of open source is that it's collaboration at scale. It's happening on, on a level which is really mind boggling. So if you look at examples like Kubernetes, the Linux kernel, Visual Studio Code, whatever, there, there, there are tons of these really huge, huge, huge open source projects. I will show some numbers later. Um, cooperation going beyond that. So I mentioned that before to, to one of you, there are 1.8 million Go packages out there. I mean, that's, that's mind boggling. That's, that's a crazy number of software developed by in the end, one community. Of course, they are not dependent on each other in many cases, but I mean, it's, it's a huge thing you have to, be, you have to um, get under control. And um, this collaboration across companies makes this possible and you, you end up with something which you could call yeah, peer production. You get a lot of people to work on something together um, to create values. And just to illustrate this point a little bit more, um, this, this is a graph from the Kubernetes uh, code statistics. 
So in the last month, they had contributions from more than 300 companies, um, more than 3,000 developers were contributing there. And this is one project. They work on this together. So uh, software development and scale does work. We can, it's proof. <laughs> Another interesting um, example is Visual Studio Code. Uh, you would have never imagined that Microsoft is doing something like that. Um, in the five years or the four years, actually, they are running now, they have accumulated more than a thousand developers who are working on, on the core itself. That's one project. So imagine how you organize a thousand people to work on a project. That's a real, real challenge. And they, they are productive. They have closed 74,000 issues in this, in this time. So this, this is bug fixes, this is feature requests, and so on. It's one of the really well-organized communities. And you can learn a lot from that uh, by, by looking at how it works. And that was a little bit more like, I mean, collaboration at scale. It's a practice, but how does that work? What are the elements? And I want to talk a little bit more about that. What, what are practices which help that? And I would say one, one of the important ones, and I mentioned that before, this commitment is reflected in a culture of ownership. So open so in open source communities, you usually have this culture that people own what they are doing. They own this, not in a sense of uh, monetary owning, but, but they, they take responsibility for, for that. And you can see that, for example, in, in project maintainership, you have in almost all projects, you have a maintainer, you have maintainers of different projects and so on. And you have often quite, um, sometimes it's just an unwritten rule like a benevolent dictator for life. So that would be the Linus Torvalds style. So there's one guy who has started the project, he's still around. He's still the, I don't know, most clever guy in the room. So he is still the dictator who um, has, is the only one who has uh, access rights to the releases of the Linux kernel which is a fine model. I mean, it, in this case, it, it works. There are other models where you have more hierarchy or you have um, a flat hierarchy and uh, you have a more distributed way of doing things. Uh, but but the, the key thing here is that you don't become a maintainer by getting appointed uh, to be it or by having the most power or the most powerful company behind you, but because you have done good work like founding the project, writing a lot of good code, or dealing with people in the right way. So it's based on something which is not um, qua uh, position, but because you actually have proven that you can do the work. Uh, this is also reflected in something like um, this mantra of stepping down responsibly, what, what a lot of open source projects explicitly put in their uh, codes that you actually, if you are a maintainer and you don't have time anymore, you have to, you, you can just leave Sure, that would be the bad way, but what you have to do actually is to find a new maintainer or find a different way to organize the project. And that can be a really interesting process. The, the Python community, for example, they have gone through this process recently and uh, replaced the benevolent dictator for life by, by another structure with having a more, more democratic uh, way of doing that. It's very interesting to, to follow that. Um, and I think what this culture of ownership also enables is um, a lot of developer motivation. Uh, you know, these uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, which are the elements which drive motivation of, of uh, people who are doing this kind of work. I think that's very present in open source because you have this autonomy because of the openness. Yeah? You, you can apply this mastery because you are responsible for, for your own work. You have this purpose because that's the only reason why this community is coming together. So th this is very motivational. And um, this, this also gives... Uh, yeah, the base for this, uh, it's also kind of a uh, quote you hear a lot in open source communities, those who do the work decide. It's kind of a distributed decision making where those people who care and who can take the decision actually do it. And action is the, the currency in which you pay um, for what you're doing. Another element um, which allows the scaling is asynchronous and written communication. And uh, this is especially important in these companies um, and these, these communities where you have a very distributed um, um, set of people. So different locations, different time zones, uh, different styles of work, maybe different times when they, they are available and so on. Um, some companies are driven by meetings and you have the feeling that, okay, the only way to get work done is to having meetings, but this doesn't scale because um, when you are not able to put all the people concerned in one room anymore, then what do you do? I mean, you can stop doing it or you can 
split up the thing um, or you find a way how to actually take a decision without getting, getting everybody at the same time at the same place. And the proven way in open source basically is the mailing list. And uh, this is something which also uh, automatically gives some documentation and you can track what, what is happening. Uh, it's a challenge, of course, because talking in person is effective and um, it's not something you, you can get rid of, I think. Uh, um, but what many open source communities do is they, they use that not as a method to, to work, but more like, like a catalyst to, to make this work possible. So you meet maybe once a year on a conference and you know the guy you, you are, you're, you're working with, you know how, how they tick and you can uh, work with them. And that fuels, uh, fuels work for another year and, and until you meet at the next conference, for example. Sure. Um, I think it's a, an, I think it's a very valid discussion, and it also depends on what kind of documentation. I mean, the documentation I was referring to here is more like uh, what, what is naturally part of the process. So, so when you take a decision and uh, you have to discuss that on the mailing list, then somebody who hasn't taken part can read up the mail thread and then knows, okay, that's what was related. I think another part of the documentation is when then afterwards somebody writes the minutes of, of the meeting or whatever and puts it in some repository and nobody ever reads it anymore. I mean, that, that, that might be useless documentation. So, and I think it's actually a real challenge um, to, to make sense of this, this, this wealth of data you, you aggregate over time when, when you're working in this, this way. Um, so uh, I think it's, to me, it's a little bit of an open question what, what the perfect way to, to get out of this is. Um, but what I think is important is that it's, it's there um, in some form for people to consume when they are not in the same place if, uh, with, with the others when decisions are taken. So another thing which is kind of also a natural um, effect of uh, the, the openness is feedback. Feedback in open source projects, sometimes this can be brutal because actually your users have your email address so they can tell you, uh, my pro your program has crashed, please fix it. Um, I have to give a presentation in 10 minutes, so <laughs> please help me. So that's, that's the part which is stressful. On the other hand, it's wonderful because as a maintainer, as a developer, you actually get actual users to talk to you and you know what they do and what doesn't work. So, so you can actually react to that. I think the most beautiful thing about that is if, if you get into the cycle that, that uh, a user does a useful, respectful bug report, you fix it and you get feedback then this, that the bug actually is fixed. And in an open source project, this can happen sometimes within minutes. Um, uh, so that if you are online at the same, you happen to be online at the same time, you do a fix and then the user is maybe ready to try it out. That's a feedback loop, which, which is amazing. And th this is what drives uh, yeah, good, good software and drives also innovation on a bigger scale. Um, and that doesn't end on, on the user developer level, but also peer review, code review, for example. I mean, that's one of the really, really common practices. If you look at GitHub, this is all about pull requests and code review, and there are great tools, great culture, great practices, how to do that. And there's no other way how to do that. And you do that in the open, so also the, the the level of quality there is quite high because you have basically a whole world which can comment on what you are doing. It can be scary, but can also be very rewarding. Yeah, and then the, the release early, release often mantra, uh, which also I think was, is, was coming from, from the Linux kernel. I mean, that, that's something, the, after you, the more often you release, the more often you get feedback, the more often you can uh, fail and learn something and improve and fix it. And you just go much faster if you do that. Okay, and the last one, code sharing. Um, that's a little bit more a practical one and kind of an obvious one. Of course, if you're doing open source software, you're sharing code. Um, so all code is available to everybody. You can actually see why things don't work. You can figure it out yourself. You can even fix it um, or suggest a fix. So th this is, I think, very powerful. And we take it as a given um, in open source communities because that's kind of the definition that the code is open. That's very different if you look into companies. I will come to that in a minute. You can also learn from that, you can contribute. So this is these, these contribute over re-event. I think that, that's an that's a, uh, important principle that, that you don't have to re-event the same stack again, but you can just use what is there. And to illustrate that, 
One of the more popular Python modules is the request module for doing HTTP um, access. Um, GitHub just recently added this feature to show how many repositories on GitHub use this repository. So it's 400,000 repositories projects which are using this module. That's also an amazing number. So if you're doing something in this module, it will affect on GitHub alone 400,000 people or 400,000 projects, which probably then have, again, um, dozens of people or some, mostly probably just one, but in many cases, many more. Um, so so this, this is really, and again, that this is an inclination, indication that it works. Um, so why it works, that's of course a little bit what, what is I think more in the values and how you approach that. So, um, to capture that, the spirit of open source, that's community. Uh, this is a picture of the KDE community, actually. So on the last conference, a um, um, happy bunch of people. And um, I think to really understand why open source works, you have to get into these groups. You have to join conferences or meetups or whatever to learn to know how, how, how this works. Go, go to, I don't know, your favorite project, what you are using a lot and try to contribute and see how this works and, and get the feeling for that. I think that's, that's really the spirit uh, which is there, which gives you the understanding how, how it works. Yep. Uh, 20 something <laughs> and it's still alive. It's amazing for software. <laughs> so that's great. How do I get this into my company? <clears throat> the good thing I think is that in many cases, if you look what you have, you have a lot of these elements already, probably. A lot of these, if, if you look at how, how you call it in a corporate context, so for example, agile development, we talked about that before. Some of the values like openness, transparency, commitment, self-organization, that could be the textbook of open source as well. I think that's, that's shared values and you, you can, you, you, you see a match there. Also other things, I mean, companies, they you often talk about customer focus. I mean, that's what, what open source people do when they release early release often. Or time to market, uh, that's, that's the same thing. Employee retention, I mean, how do we motivate our people? I mean, open source does that kind of naturally. So you might use the same methods, actually. Partnerships, uh, collaboration across organi organizational boundaries. I mean, a company usually sets up some kind of partnership, but also companies have figured out that it often is easier to join an open source community than setting up an own legal structure with own contracts and everything. So you find that. DevOps is another example, I think, which is very open source value inspired. So treat uh, everything as code, um, let people take ownership and responsibility. That also comes from what, what you see in open source communities. You have project management, so you do networking in a company, you have these fancy uh, meetings in open source that also comes kind of naturally. I mean, here or in open source communities where people just meet to hack on something because they like that. So you already have a lot of that there. Um, so I think the question then for a company who, who wants to do that in a more structured way um, boils down to what if we did open source, uh, but wait, we don't want to do that in the open. We don't want to do that publicly. We do that within our company. So we want to benefit from the culture. We want to benefit from, from the uh, uh, yeah, procedures and practices, but maybe we have a business model where we can't open our code, or maybe we don't want to put our developers into public because that's, that's too scary, scary. And I think it's fine. I mean, there are good reasons to not do open source software, but still uh, a lot of these values and, and practices apply. And in this way, inner source, if you do it in a conscious and structured way, can be a way how to apply these principles, but it can also serve as kind of a stepping stone um, towards open source. So you uh, learn how, how this style of work goes, and then maybe you are in a position where you change your business model and you publish stuff. So, and inner source, I think, needs some um, buy-in. Uh, needs also some strategic um, maybe decisions. So from the company, I mean, the company has to support that in terms of values. It can come, I think, from um, top down. It can come bottom up, uh, but it needs support and a certain kind of culture match to be possible. 
Um, but I think the, the, the details are actually very, very flexible and diverse. There's no recipe for doing inner source. It's, you have to adapt to you, the reality of your company. So what I want to talk about a little bit is about tactics, how you can maybe do little things and small steps to benefit from inner source uh, without having to do everything in one go. And um, one of the fundamental things there's code sharing um, in companies, especially in big companies, you often have very practicable challenges. So where is the code? And maybe nobody knows where all the code is. Nobody has the complete overview because you have different systems where people do that. Or you have permissions which don't allow one team to look into the code of the other team. So they might develop the same thing. Nobody never, ever finds out. Um, so th this is um, kind of the practical challenge um, for, for that. Uh, possible solution is yeah, to change that, to introduce something like a code hosting um, site internally. And that's what, for example, GitHub or GitLab or the, the, the other of these tools, which you know from the open source um, development, um, they are brought into companies. And you have the uh, products which they sell to um, companies which want to do that internally. Another interesting part of that also is um, legal challenges. So I, I remember a situation where I was talking with a company actually about inner source or they didn't call it inner source. They wanted to apply open source principles. And, and I, saw, so I, I give them a presentation. I said, okay, let's, you, you have to think of this and that and that and that. And I mentioned, okay, think of licensing. Uh, that, that's an important part. So open source is all about licensing. So think about that. And they said, oh no, it's, it's just internal. We don't need licenses. So then I asked, okay, why, why are, you, you're, are you actually sharing code uh, between the teams and so on? I said, ah, no, because yeah, there is this one thing and there's a contractor who has some rights and there's this third party, third party module and so on. Ah, yeah, okay, may, maybe we need to regulate that before we can share it. Ah, okay, sure, we, we do need a license. It's really something which is important. And um, so that the rights on code are known and defined. So you know what to share under which conditions um, and you uh, yeah, respect third party rights you take in the different um, conditions there. And one possible solution for that in an inner source scenario is, is an inner source license. So you usually don't want to go with an open source license because that actually gives the right to give the code to everybody who receives the software. So um, that's, uh, that doesn't work. So you need a more restricted version. So the challenge here is to come up with something which is um, still open enough, but um, fulfills the purpose that the code is not going outside of your company. And another resource I want to mention here and give a few examples is um, the inner source commons. So that's a community of inner source practitioners. And um, they collected on the innersourcecommons.org website uh, resources like some articles, some books. Um, there's a wiki with information. They do, it, um, uh, I think, biannual meetings or something like that, events where they join. The content is available under Creative Commons. And what they have is what I find very uh, uh, yeah, interesting and, and also helpful is um, a list of inner source patterns. So that's proven. Uh, patterns, how you can apply open source principles to uh, in internal company situation. And I want to give you um, three examples. Uh, there are more on the website. So one is um, the 30 day warranty. So in a company, you often have the problem, you have a team working on something, they're maintaining a software component as, and there's another team which uses that. So, um, but they need a different feature. So they write this feature. In an open source world, you would just contribute that, but in the inner source world, the, the team uh, which has the responsibility of the module might be reluctant to take the, take the change because they don't know if they can maintain it, if they have the knowledge, the time, um, to, to, and if the code is actually any good. So they, they are paid for maintaining that and they take the blame. So one way how to get around that is uh, to establish expectations and maybe kind of an internal informal contract that the team contributing takes over a 30 day warranty where they put, uh, yeah, fix bugs and um, help the team to maintain the components so to get into more this, uh, uh, yeah, this mode of sharing in, in a safer way where you establish clear expectations. And if you formalize that a little bit, I think that that's a nice kind of yeah, tactic to help in a corporate setting to um, enable code sharing in a better way. Another pattern uh, 
which might seem a little bit obvious, but within a corporation, it's, it's also something you might have to establish in a little, little bit more formal way. So if you have inner source projects um, and they are open to contributions from other people in the company, um, then you, they, they might have the problem that other people in the company just don't know about these projects. So how do you solve that? And often you don't have the central point where you can just look up everything and you will find it. So introducing something like an inner source portal, which allows um, yeah, maintainers of inner source projects to get together with possible contributors is something uh, which is actually helpful. And if you feed that from kind of automatically from, from uh, some metadata in your code repository, you get a, a, yeah, a portal which makes it easier to find um, inner source projects so that you can actually build up and build up sharing there. And the third one, um, that might also seem very simple, but, but also there I think it's quite powerful to formalize that in some way. So praise participants. Um, often you forget that. I mean, the, somebody contributes something to you and uh, especially in a corporate setting, you might think, okay, yeah, it's his job, so uh, he did the work, so what? Uh, but we, try, we are trying to establish these uh, principles of openness and self-motivation and self-organization. So that's actually a very simple but very effective way to say thank you. And you can do that by calling out people in the chat, for example, saying, yeah, great patch, thank you, good work. Um, or you can also do that to also um, <clears throat> yeah, play some of the more corporate um, uh, things there, send their manager an email and say, okay, this, this person contributed, that's great. So you increase the chances that you will get the time to do it again. So th these are three examples for patterns, simple tactics you can apply. Um, and in a corporate setting, it's easier to formalize these because you can set up rules more easily. And, and that, that's maybe also kind of how people are used to work and how companies are used to work. So they have these more structures. That, that's more um, easy um, than to use these structures to actually create more open. So uh, what is open source? I hope I've shown that it's both. <laughs> so I would argue make use of all of it, but apply it to your context, put it in the context that you want to use it, take the things which work um, and uh, learn from others. And as all of these learning experience are also open on this website, for example, or in general, um, I think that that's a great chance uh, to improve um, a lot of software development and the life of a lot of software developers. More reading material, there's a great book, Adopting Inner Source, um, Principles and Case Studies. It's available, I think it's also linked on the Inner Source Commons website. And um, it describes uh, more the inner source principles in a little bit more structured way than, than I did it. Um, so this is an interesting read, but the most interesting part of the book is case studies of uh, a couple of companies who have done inner source for a long time um, in, in some cases. So Bosch, for example, is an interesting case here from Germany. They are doing inner source for 10 years already and they have established a, a really very structured and, and well thought out process um, and iterated on that. And they write about how, how that works in this book. So that's very interesting to read if you're inter interested in, okay, what, what actually works? So less theory and more, more practice. Yeah, so good reading material. And that's what I wanted to tell you. So thank you. And I'm open for questions. <laughs> right, you should be using this to record it. Oh. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Okay. I didn't realize it uh, was anybody around. Should you get <laughs> uh, so open source is using a lot of GitHub and a lot of companies are using Jira. Does it mean that uh, maybe in a company we should use GitHub more for issue tracking? I think a lot of companies are actually moving this way. I mean, GitHub Enterprise is, is the, the version companies can host and um, they have a lot of customers. They are the Git, GitLab, for example, they also provide a tool. Uh, the, their tool for uh, in a company version and I mean Jira of course is the dream of the project manager who wants to have everything under control and have has all dependencies and everything is tracked and you always know what is on time and whatnot um, if that works or not I mean 
I don't know. I haven't seen too many Jira instances, so I have no opinion on that. Yeah, prob probably people who are more <laughs> uh, uh, educated to tell that. But I think in, in the end, one, one thing about open source is that you do the things which work uh, and um, you do the things people actually do. Um, and then you build the process around that and not the other way around. And I think that's the same principle. So if Jira is what a team is naturally doing, then I would say, go for it, love it. If that's something which is coming from a management decision to roll out a company-wide project management system and developers are actually writing things on pieces of paper instead of putting it into, to, into Jira, then maybe a more simple way like using GitHub issues is the better way. At Deutsche Bahn, do you have an issue of reconciling people working at the same time in a team and in an inner source project? And if you have an issue, how do you fix that? Or how do you address that? So, um, at Deutsche Bahn, actually, I have to say, we, we don't have a formal inner source program. So, um, uh, uh, a lot of what I, I said about these principles, which you can find in islands, that, that applies there quite well. So, for example, in the way how we approach Agile, I think a lot of the values and, and the style of work, um, this is re represented there. Um, so, um, I think it's a challenge, actually, um, and I don't have a complete overview, so, so I can't really answer the question. Uh, but I think it's actually a challenge to, to um, yeah, yeah, get harmony of, of these things. Where, where is the, the, uh, yeah, the boundary b between, okay, this is useful for what I'm paid for and what customers pay us for, and uh, this, this is what is nice, but maybe not essential to have. And then of course, there's this area of things nobody wants to pay for, but which is necessary and somebody has to do it. And you have to find a way how to um, get to structure um, this cost-wise. And uh, I think that's, that's what's happening. But it's a, I think it's a constant struggle. And, and of course, one, one thing I think you realize when you do open source is that the only way to do open source efficiently and also in an economic way is to not just use it, but also contribute to it, get part of the communities. So I think that's an important part, but that's something which is culturally um, um, yeah, harder to establish. That's not, I would say, common sense yet. But I think the big companies, they have realized that. So if you look at the huge examples like Microsoft, I mean, they explicitly tell that you have to contribute. And of course, they also have the resources to do that. It might be more difficult for smaller companies. Also, might be more difficult for, for example, consulting companies and product companies might have more resources to do that. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, hey. I will try to formalize my question because, yeah, I'm thinking I'm really tired. Uh, <laughs> you talk like open source, like, in a beautiful way, like pure and shared spirit and things like that in your presentation. So that sounds cool. Uh, my question is, for example, you gave example like Linux kernel or Kubernetes or Golang. Uh, Linux kernel is the most developer there from Intel, IBM, Google, Facebook, something, this kind of company. Most of these companies, they, they pay developers for developing the kernel or Kubernetes or things like that. But they, they develop that like because they see as a product, because they sell Kubernetes to you, they sell Linux to you, like uh, Hat Hat or Pinkas, they sell support. Um, you know you know what I mean? A lot of developers they're developing, but the company gets the, the knowledge and they sell that. My my question is, how do you see, see that? This is open source. I, I understand the difference maybe between free and open, but I wanna I wanna know your opinion because you are inside yeah. of the community. What's your opinion about that? And your company, like Deutsche Bank, when you do like, hmm? Deutsche Bank, Bar. sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your company, you develop open source, you help the community because it's community help in the company, but you only help the community based on what you need. Like, you know what I mean? Okay, now I need to change request libraries because I need this feature. So I will help the community. But in, in the end, what you need is like, People help me with the comp. You are trying, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, uh, what's your opinion about that? Yeah. Uh, let's start with the first one. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned the Linux kernel quite sometimes because it's one of the biggest scale communities and not everything is beautiful about this community. They also have their issues, of course. Um, so, but uh, I think they have developed uh, the maturity in, in a lot of ways. Uh, what the, the, the beautiful thing about the life as a kernel developer is you can basically do whatever you want. You will always find somebody who will pay you 
because the demand for kernel developers is so high that you have a lot of freedom and um, you have developers who, who are paid by Intel or who are paid by Red Hat or paid by Zuse or paid by whoever. So you have all these people, that's, that's true. Um, but you also see these people, okay, they, they move between the companies because they can. And uh, the dedication to the project is more important than the um, affiliation with the company. And the companies actually support that actively because for them, it's, it's a value that you have these people who are self-motivated, who are experts in their fields, who are recognized by the community, which are also recognized not because they work for you, but because they have the expertise. And that this, on the other side, gives the company um, the benefit that they have these trusted people. And, and it's, it's less about influencing that, that they would exert control about what is developed or something, but they have the means to, um, yeah, to, to facilitate development uh, in where, where it's necessary. So they have the people who, who can fix problems for customers, for example, and then get the fixes into the upstream kernel, which, which sometimes is not easy. And if you have the people who do that, then as a company, you end up with the value that your patch is upstream and the patch of your, uh, of your competitor is not. So then guess whose development process is more expensive? Um, that, that's where you get this natural, I think, uh, yeah, benefit of working together and collaborating between um, companies. And it's not, I, I think it's, and there's nothing bad in it in any way because nobody loses that. It's really just uh, everybody's winning there uh, because it's a common base. And um, then what you as a company sell usually is not the open source code, but some service on top of it or product on top of it or, or whatever. So this, this is something which I think is quite important. And um, that's also, I think that, that leads me to, to, the, to the other part of your question, um, this contributing. I think for, for many companies, it's, um, it's not natural because you think of that, okay, we have written the code, so we are done, uh, uh, cost sunk, so let's stop it here and do no, no, nothing more. Uh, but then you, you get into this situation that, um, yeah, you have this fixed, and then there's a new version of the code you've fixed, and you haven't taken the effort to bring it upstream, and that, that might happen a year later. And then what, what do you do? Um, there's a security fix in the code you, you need to, to update. So you, you, you might be stuck in a situation where you suddenly realize you have to put in a lot of effort, a lot of costs um, uh, uh, to, to actually um, get, get done what, what you could have done before. So it's a bit about foresight and about um, yeah, behaving as uh, what I like to call it as a good open source citizen. So that, that you take care of the, the common grounds you all base your work on. And uh, this pays off. It doesn't pay off directly. So, so you have to see that this is kind of an investment you are doing. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it comes back. And this is the lesson which I think companies have to learn and have to understand. And it's maybe not, not always true and not for all projects. And most companies will do something like strategically uh, look at what projects are important and, and where is it worth contributing. And this will lead to a situation where you then have these contributions. And um, <clears throat> uh, one other thing about that is that um, Sometimes you have these projects which are kind of left out. So everybody's using, but nobody really realizes that they are not staffed enough and they don't have enough people to fix all the problems. And we have seen some prominent examples in the past where uh, <clears throat> yeah, suddenly there were yeah, the press, oh, there's the security bug in this library, which everybody uses. And, and uh, th this is a problem. And I think that's also something which has to be addressed by, by the industry. So, so and, uh, yeah, organizations like the Linux Foundation, they've started a project to, to fund uh, these common projects which don't have a business model, which don't have a strong company behind that, uh, whereas maybe a small company is doing something on the side and, or, or a freelancer is developing something. And uh, I think at the moment there, there is a lot of experimentation with that, how to actually pay open source developers in a good way. My personal opinion is that the best way really is if companies realize that if they rely on software, they need to contribute to actually being able to effectively use it and that they pay developers to do the work. Um, I think that that's the most sustainable um, and scalable model. Um, I think in some areas we are getting there and um, we have some really prominent examples which got that, like I mentioned before, Microsoft is amazing in, in how many open source work they, they do now. You wouldn't have believed that um, yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah.
Kubernetes also is an interesting example. Um, I just this morning um, on, on Twitter, my, my, my feed was full of people who said, oh, I was in this keynote um, uh, on, on KubeCon, the Kubernetes conference happening in San Diego uh, right now. Um, there was this keynote, 12,000 people conference for an, for an open source project. And uh, the, the tweets were, oh, and, and uh, this keynote by, by Kelsey Hightower, one, one of the developer evangelists at Google, he said, okay, and I'm sitting here and crying. What is happening? <laughs> because he, he, he gave such an emotional and, and great keynote that people really felt uh, in, in a way which I think is very rare in professional settings and, uh, and, and yeah, professional conferences. But the Kubernetes project, I think especially, I mean, they have managed to, to establish a fantastic culture of being able to, to um, yeah, feel together as a community and have a very uh, yeah, respectful culture and people who support that in, in a fantastic way. We have a lot of questions today. Okay. <laughs> okay, two questions. One quick one first. Um, would you consider it in their source if there's something my company invented and there's no upstream outside the company that's yeah. still in their source? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, I think inner sources, um, there's no trademark on inner source. I mean, you, you, you can use it in, in a way if you develop it internally, but I would even say if you share it between two teams which haven't talked to each other before and they develop something in, uh, um, together, um, doesn't matter if it's outside or not. I mean, that's a start of applying open source principles. So that's inner source for sure. <laughs> okay, so the, the more important question, um, what's the minimum size of my company for me to get the benefits from inner source? Because as in your example, when I have two teams who share code, I just created a dependency and this is not a good place to be because um, if, they, if the teams don't have dedicated capacity to fix bugs in the shared library, um, it's yeah, not a good place to be. So yeah. what, what's your minimum size? It, it looks like inner source works from like a thousand developers upwards. Yeah, I, I, again, I think it's it's a matter of what part of inner source concepts and principles you, you look at. I think um, some of them uh, only work if you have a big company. Like, like this, the, the, the quote I had before, there are more smart people outside of your company than inside. I mean, that's very, very true if you have a company of 10 people. Um, that's still true when you have a company of 100,000 people, but there actually, there will be a lot of smart people which are not in your team and you don't know. So, so this, um, yeah, uh, benefiting from, from the, the, the wisdom of, of a bigger group, I mean, there, the bigger the group, the better. And I mean, um, uh, for, for these things, I actually would say, I mean, inner source is great in, in big companies and in, in really big companies if you manage to, to do that, but doing open source is even better. And, and uh, I think in these cases, maybe sometimes uh, doing open source right away is actually easier because the rules are clear and, uh, and you don't have to invent anything. Um, but there are other principles which I think can, can also be applied on a much smaller scale. Like, like what I mentioned before, this say thank you, um, the, this tactics. I mean, that's something which I've, I think works on almost all levels. And in a corporate setting, I mean, even in a small company setting, even in a startup, I mean, sometimes, sometimes you forget that. And that's something, if you can formalize that in a, in a way, that's, that's helpful. And this probably will foster collaboration also between small teams. So the question I have is, is it's very clear that open source works really well, right? It's, it's done many times. Yep. Um, what I'm interested in is how do you actually apply inner source in your company today, right? You've mentioned a few tactics. It sounds very theoretical. Like what do you do today that really embraces inner source? Because I see a lot of value in it, but I want to mm -hmm. know exactly what you do. Yeah. So as I said, in, in the company I work for now, um, so we don't have a formal program for that. So that comes more to this where you see where things match and you see, okay, these agile principles, for example, they match with open source principles. So you can tell, okay, th this is something where you have kind of identified the common principle and use that. If you're interested in very concrete um, details, I, I would really recommend this book with the case studies because there you have very concrete um, uh, yeah, stories about how they set up the project and how they set up the, this program. I think these patterns are interesting because the patterns I mentioned, the, the, they are all tested and applied patterns. So the, these are things which um, actual companies actually have used successfully to support an inner source program. What, what I believe is, and I've been in many environments, to actually open source is a lot easier 
Yeah. yeah. It's well understood. Yeah. And if the company is agreeable to the concept, you openly open source your technology, you share to each other, and you use it. Yeah. With inner source, there's a lot more bureaucracy, politics that come into play. Yeah. And I think there needs to be a very delicate way of managing that, which in theory, yeah, you embrace agile, you have some elements of it. But I don't think it really closes the loop entirely. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very true. And, and sometimes um, doing open source actually also is an inner source tactic because sometimes it's easier to share some, something with another part of the company by open sourcing it than going through the process of sharing it internally. So this also can be a tactic. Sometimes it's really, as, as you said, open source is well tested, well defined, so that's easier to use. Uh, but of course, you also have to see the realities of the company. And that's what why I'm a little bit hesitant to say this is the recipe because there is no one recipe. It all depends on the internal politics, on the internal structure, on the internal mindset, on the internal maturity, on the business model. I mean, a company who is selling software licenses exclusively, I mean, they will have a hard time with open sourcing anything because that immediately kills the business. But a company who is selling services, I mean, they, they probably won't lose much if they open source anything, uh, their, their software. To follow up on that, would you say it's easier to start with a completely new project as an inner source or try to inner source an existing one? Um, I think starting new is, is easier because you don't have this baggage of existing things. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, also we talked about that before informally. Um, doing an open source project, it's exactly the same story. Um, re, uh, yeah, thinking a project after it has already gone through some iterations is more difficult because then the setup is, is not right. So I think it's easier to start with some cell somewhere where you give people freedom to start things in a new way and, and then um, the, these can expand. <clears throat> um, so you mentioned something called like uh, security patches that sometimes happens uh, on an open source project. Yeah. Since it's open and it's like everybody can see it, if some person discovers some like vulnerability, they say, okay, well, I'm going to fix it or they're going to raise it. But what if the, like people discover it and not say it yet so they can use it on their own way? Is there any way to prevent that, to prevent like a security issues in the software? So, um... Yeah, I mean, I mean that that of course happens, uh, and I mean that that's where the dynamics, because the good and the evil players have to be balanced in some way. Uh, I think all of the big um, and the responsible open source projects they have procedures how to deal with security fixes. They have these responsible disclosure principles so that actually uh, security researchers can uh, share uh, issues they they find with the open source projects in a secret way so that before everybody knows about that, so that fixes can be developed. Um, and, and this is also shared then between different uh, uh, other com uh, companies which work with this software, or also between projects. So for example, if you have forks of the same project, you might have the same security bug in completely different projects, uh, but usually the developers know about that. And so, so in the, in the well-managed projects, you have a way how to share that. Um, and then you have, of course, all these other security projects like uh, yeah, bug bounties where, where you actually actively encourage people to, to find problems where companies pay money for, for, for that. I mean, that's a way how to fight that. I mean, that, that doesn't prevent that somebody finds an issue and sells it on the black market to the highest bidder. I mean, that happens as well. Um, but I think open source uh, projects and, and there I would say open source is not that different from proprietary code because they have exactly the same problem. I mean, if there's a security issues, uh, then, then it has to be fixed and you have to fix it in a way that it's uh, not too easy to exploit it. Keeping the code open is not going to make it uh, more, uh, increase the or increase the risk? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's a debate about that if uh, opening the code um, makes this more prone to security issues because everybody can find them. Um, on the other hand, it's also easier to fix them. And if it's easier to find them, um, then the, the good people who find them, report them responsibly, they will help to find that. So I'm actually personally feel much safer with an open source program where I can say, okay, the code is visible to everybody. So if it's used by people, there will be people who look at the code in most cases. 
they might not find everything, but um, it's transparent. So I, I can also judge for myself if that happens and what kind of procedures do that. But if I use a program I get from the company and they say, okay, we do everything secure, I have no idea what is in their code. I mean, I have to trust them. Transparency, I think, is helpful to establish trust. So <laughs> that's where my preference lies. <laughs> Thank you very much for all these questions. I think Rails will be available for a few minutes and we can talk there. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Uh, we are looking for feedback about how it works here, how it works in our new office. If you have anything, uh, talk to me or some of our organizers, write us uh, on Twitter or Meetup or whatever. We will read that, I guess, somewhere. So thank you again for coming. We have still uh, beer and maybe some pizza. Do we have pizza? No, no pizza. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> only only beer. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think we have to leave uh, the office before 10. So just like we have uh, one hour for our talks. Thank you very much and see you next time in January because uh, we know it's going to be in January. So yeah, see you. Ich habe noch nie gesehen, also die Grafik habe ich noch nie gesehen. Ich